Hi, I'm Danny Elfman. This is Shirley Manson. This is Debbie Harry. This is Chris Stein of Blondie. This is Roland Olsabal from Tears for Fears. This is Billy Idol. This is Alex Ebert, a.k.a. Edward Sharp, giving the story behind the song. Hi, this is Peter Chotty, host of the story behind the song. Each month I speak to some of music's biggest artists to get the inside stories behind their most lasting and iconic songs. Join me for new episodes on the third Monday of every month on the story behind the song from the Consequence Podcast Network, available wherever you get your podcasts. The police were one of the biggest, if not the biggest, band worldwide in the early to mid-80s. They released five stellar albums, numerous hit singles, and they introduced a lot of people to ska and reggae. Though they didn't play reggae or ska in a traditional sense, their music was informed by the genres, particularly in drummer Stuart Copeland's beats. For a lot of people, getting into the police was the first step towards diving into the wide world of ska and reggae. Today we bring on police's drummer Stuart Copeland, who influenced many, many drummers, including me. Aaron, when I first met you, you were playing drums a lot. Would you say Stuart Copeland was one of your biggest influences? I would say he was my biggest influence. Biggest influence. When I remember the early version of Flat Planet, it was extremely police influenced. Yeah. But even as we moved away from musically sounding like the police, my drumming was always like influenced by Stuart Copeland, the way he pushed the beat, the way he played really emphasize the hi-hats, like doing lots of stuff on the hi-hats, having a high-pitched snare. Mm -hmm. Really anything I gleaned from him, I was trying to put into the band. Splash cymbals too. Splash cymbals, yes. Yeah. Records used to be relatively expensive. The police album I had in my house was Synchronicity. What was your big police album? Um, Probably uh, Regatta de Blanc and uh, Zenyatta Mandata, but you know, I had the box set. So I really just liked all of it, including the B-sides. Excellent. First off, I want to say that um, I really enjoyed reading uh, your new book, the Stuart Copeland's Police Diaries. Really cool to kind of like, yeah, just fill in. All well, the you're the guy. first person I've talked to who's actually read it. Okay, I read- <laughs> Aaron's an avid reader. Yes. I haven't actually seen the book. It's going to arrive any day now, I suppose. But I actually haven't seen the book. Uh, I got a PDF, so but and I have a I have a actual book on the way. But I got to go through the PDF. It looks really cool. It's got all the images of it's got the images of the diary and the diary entries. So and then the cool photos. So it looks awesome. Yeah, cool. Uh, you know, all my you know, don't look squint too hard at the accounts. Uh, my <laughs> arithmetic was not great. <laughs> you know, but the, the doodles the doodles are not art. They're just like a, a diseased mind doing something with my left hand while I'm talking on the phone. Yeah. Some, one of the funny things to read uh, through the diary is some of the stuff that you wrote at the time. And then you comment in present time. And a lot of the stuff's like, Oh, this thing's coming up. And then you're like, that thing didn't come up, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. <laughs> well, yeah, well, there's three layers to it. Well, uh, several, uh, there's the doodles, uh, but there's the, the daily notes, you know, how much we got paid for a show, uh, how many attended, you know, all, all that stuff, how well we played and all that, so on. Then there's the modern commentary. But the other part is the the, the secret diaries. that, that, that oh, yeah. I, They weren't connected to any particular day. Just whenever I had to get stuff off my mind, I just start writing furiously without thinking about what I was even really writing, just to get it off my chest. And that's where all the grievance uh, nurturing, uh, crack pocket schemes, uh, you know, <laughs> Wild fantasies, uh, revenge theories, you know. All the good stuff. To me, looking back on it, it's it, its comedic. Right. So you um, recently found the diaries? Is that sort of what prompted this project? No, I've had them all along. And I've always wanted to do something with them. And I finally got around to it. I found a publisher who, who had a great concept of how to present them. And um, that's what it took, really. Yeah. And it covers uh, 76, so before police to 78, which is kind of right before, or right as police are really starting to blow up. We were just starting to get our first hits. Uh, it was just starting to take off. It's sort of, you know, the, the when we take when we went off, off to America, uh, is where the, the movie that I made picks up. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I sort of cover a bit of America, but mainly it's about the starving years before that, which is much more interesting than the rest of it. The the success part, because the success part was kind of repetitive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you retell the story of the police in retrospect, you know, it feels like, oh, it was inevitable. But when, you, when you're when you in the moment, it doesn't feel inevitable that it's going to be successful. Oh, man. The, the struggle, the every day, the grind, get up. Pick, go over to so-and-so, pick up the truck, drive over to Sting's Race, pick up the gear, go over to rehearsal, rehearsal for 10 hours, go to a gig, go to another gig, you know, just like this relentless activity uh, makes me tired looking at it. When you think about that time period, what's what's like the, the vibe? What's What do you see in your mind or what do you smell? London. London. What does London smell like? Um, there's a particular, it doesn't smell like that anymore, by the way. Okay. Because they've cleaned up the smog. The famous London smog isn't there anymore. Mm. But it's basically car fumes, you know, uh, the smell of, I, I guess you get it, it, it combined with the moisture in the air. Uh, there's just, there was, a, there was a particular London smell. Yeah. And the only food. And the only food, the Indian food. That's the other thing. Yeah, I was going to say. Every yeah. single Indian meal was, a, was savored and celebrated on the page because that was the only food worth eating at the time. Sure. You know, English cuisine now is really spectacular. Yeah. Uh, London is just a great place to dine. But then it was Mike's Greasy Spoon Cafe, uh, which did have double egg sausage chips, beans, and a slice, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but the only other good food was Indian food. On any high street in any English town, there would be, you know, the Gate of India restaurant or the Taj Mahal restaurant or whatever. And it would be the cheapest and biggest and tastiest meal available in the entire nation. Post-gig meal after a show in that era, what were you getting? Um, Sag ghost with pilau rice. Hell yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. So one of the things that your diaries show too is that like during this era, like you're going through some serious struggle, like you're getting evicted. You don't have any money. Yeah. You're working all the time. It's, and it really, I mean, it really doesn't feel like it's going to pay off, except that you and Sting really, really believe in this project. Well, that's the miracle is that, that's, that we stuck at it. Exactly. And then even more miraculous is when Andy insisted on joining. Yeah. Uh, a, 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 a fake punk rock band going nowhere, and Andy insisted on joining. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him years later, you know, what what were you thinking? And he said, I don't know, mate. Should have stuck with Neil Sadaka. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really funny because you talk about that a bunch about how you guys are, you know, you're, you're fake punks trying to be in this punk scene and that having Andy Summers join the project was the final nail in the coffin of you guys pretending you're punks. Well, they, everybody knew us and written, you know, the bands all came to our shows to cop licks. Sure. Because we had chops beyond what any of them had. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I remember Paul Simonon and Sting heads together talking about bass technique, only he didn't want, um, he didn't want, um, you know, Joe Strummer to catch him giving a shit about his instrument. <laughs> yeah, you did mention in the book a few times the clash, specifically chopping licks and the critics not believing you about it. Well, I mean, I'm speaking generally. I wouldn't accuse them. In fact, we copped a major lick from them. Oh, which one? The Well, playing reggae. Skinny boys playing reggae. Oh, word. Yeah, just that move in general. <laughs> I want to talk more about the book, but I want to move into the early 80s because I specifically want to get your take on two-tone ska because as p- the police is blowing up, this is what's also happening in England. And I'd love to know kind of what your perspective on that was and and when you first started noticing these bands well it was the specials and madness were the first two and selector who didn't get quite as far um and it started with those two really and the two the two-tone movement out of uh, birmingham now ska goes w- way back earlier than those guys those were the white guys who picked it up yeah. um <laughs> and they were the two-tone bands uh racially as well as that was their motif and so the origins of the music in jamaica don't i'm not such an expert on that but when it appeared out of birmingham birmingham uh england that part there 
it was what I saw. And I remember seeing the specials at uh, the Hammersmith Palace um, just burned down the building. Wow. They had so much energy on stage. Their drummer was fantastic. You know, just everything about them was brilliant. And the wildest, wackiest, craziest, most deranged individual on the stage, I later learned, was the boss man of everything, the, the, the Svengali, the genius who created the whole circuit, a record label and everything. That would be young, one Jerry Dammers. Yeah. Were you seeing these bands uh, before they started having hits on the, on the radio, or did, did, were you witnessing this movement as it was happening in popular culture? Well, they uh, must have, to be headlining, and uh, I can't remember if it was a full house or anything, I just remember the band, but you know, to be headlining at the Hammersmith Palais, they must have made some progress. <laughs> I think I'd heard of them, sure. um, but I don't know they were on the radio yet. And at that specials gigs with Suggsy was there saying, oh, man, these guys are great. But wait till you see my band. We're called Madness. And I said, yeah, sure, brother. <laughs> <laughs> did they live up to the hype for you? They did. Hell specials yeah. was still my favorite of all sure. of them. They were the, they were my favorite. Uh, but Madness were cool. They had a, that that whole look with the pork pie hat. They had that Suggsy had that dance. That I don't know where he got it from, but it sort of patented, you know, the mad the madness dance. That that sort of I don't even know what you'd call it. Um, the, the ska dance. Well, there's two. The other guys, the toasters, are all jumping around the stage, kicking their legs out and go, dancing. But the Suggsy, the front man, just had that really cool, understated kind of shuffle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then yeah, then Chaz, the I guess he's the toaster of madness. He's got a really cool dance too. That's very, very cool and coordinated. Yeah. Yeah. Very extroverted, very out there. Madness is madness of the one who took it all the way to the top, but the other selector and specials and well, UB40 were part of that scene, but you could never call them the Scott. Yeah. But they were absolutely the same in the same scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The beat also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the beat came a little bit later, I think. Yeah, they came a little later. But we toured with all those groups, and we were all kind of out of the same stables, and there was that one summer in particular where we, we did all the summer festivals on the continent in Europe, uh, and we were all there, along with Scoffish, The Cramps, uh, you know, all these other strange groups that my brother Miles either managed or had on his record label. Yeah, the specials, I believe, so... It might have been their very first U.S. tour, or shortly thereafter, they played a bunch of shows with you in the U.S. Yes. Um, so you were still kind of at the club level at that point, or were you? You you were getting bigger by then. I think we were into th we were into theaters by then. When we were doing clubs, we were, you know, it was just local bands opening, most of whom had more equipment than us. We were always kind of intimidated. The support act, you know, plays their set. You know, the local heroes. Then they clear the stage, and there's one skinny drum set and a couple of amps. <laughs> Do you know how it ended up being that the specials came with you to the U.S.? Well, my brother Ian was the agent for the English invasion of the late 70s and early 80s. And he went out, and he went to these cities. He was working at an agency booking southern rock bands down in Macon, Georgia, Paragon Agency. But since he had just come from London, where the scene was just busting out, he thought, well, America can do this. And so he found, he went to Philadelphia, he went to Boston, he went to, um, you know, to these different cities, Chicago and so on. And he'd ask around, where do the weird kids hang out? And they say, well, there is nowhere for weird kids to hang out. And, and so he'd find a club and say, what are you doing Thursday? I got nothing Thursday. Okay, how about we'll call it punk night or new wave night. Then they'll all these weird looking kids uh, and see what happens. And so the first, and then he created a circuit um, across America, mostly in the Northeast. Hmm. And the first band, Miles and Ian brought over, uh, Miles managed a band called Squeeze, who had to be called UK Squeeze in, in America. And they yeah. put them on that circuit. Uh, Grendel's Lair in Philadelphia, uh, the Rat Club in Boston, CBGB's or Max's in New York, and, and so on. And when Squeeze finished their tour, they dropped the bus with the gear in it, two amps and a, you know, actually they had their own drums. We arrived that day 
and picked up the, the van with the two amps and <laughs> took off and played the same circuit. And followed by the specials, followed by the beat, followed by XTC, uh, Flock of Seagulls. And my brother Ian created that circuit, which enabled the new wave invasion of the late 70s. I mean, were the police the biggest band of that new wave invasion? Because it feels like that might be the case in terms of like U.S. success. Well, we were, yes, we were out front of all of them. Um, God knows, well, I guess we had better songs. I don't know, for one reason or another. <laughs> or we got there, or we got there first. You know, Squeeze, Squeeze had great songs. Uh, Specials had great songs. Um, and the beat, too. Um, I guess we got there first. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the case of the Specials and the Selector, you know, these bands didn't, they didn't last long enough, I think, to really make an impact. I mean, they did a few tours and then they broke up. Well, they were big and complicated. Yes, yeah, very much so. <laughs> and very young, very young and with no real idea of how the music industry works. Um, I don't know what ever happened. You probably know what happened to Jerry Dammer. What happened to that guy? He, you know, I never saw him say, or, he was always insane. And yet he created that whole scene, that whole Birmingham scene. Whatever happened to him? This is what I've heard, because he was supposed to be, the, the specials did a reunion, like full band reunion, like, I don't know, what was it, eight years ago? And he was going to do it. And then I heard, didn't hear it from him personally. I heard that he didn't want to do it because he didn't want to just play old songs. He wanted to do new songs too. And so he backed out. And they're like, this is what people want. They want to hear all the hits. Well, when you go see Paul McCartney, it's a great show, great show. And then he plays his new song. And I understand why he wants to do that. He has every right to play new material. But I, I think I'll take a break. I'm going to go take a leak. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, then the next one comes up. Ah, I think I'll go buy a T-shirt. He, he, <laughs> he, he does DJing. Um, and he does like, he has other projects that are kind of weird. So I think he's very much like, a, I'm an artist and this is what artists do kind of guy yeah i hate them <laughs> uh they scare me <laughs> i call them believers sure. there are some musicians who actually believe that we have a god appointed mission and that our work it isn't we all every musician on the planet every human being can play music and should play music it's not sacred it belongs to all the people um this idea where some of you know in our complex modern society where we specialize and i get to play the music and you get to buy it that's actually not how music was evolved for homo sapiens it's a bonding cultural experience um which is uh it's theorized that the reasons uh sapiens beat neanderthal is because music bonded us together in larger groups so us 20 homo sapiens could go kick those four neanderthals out of the fruit tree <laughs> And um, so the idea that some musicians have, and I won't mention names, that it's this some higher purpose. I love music. It moves me. It transports me. It's what I, I can't think of anything else I'd rather do. But it's not some God-appointed mission. It's not sacred. It's just, it's, it's cornflakes. It's for us all to enjoy. It, you know, it makes us feel it's really effective in church. God loves music um, and for various other things, sex, of course. And, you know, music is the only art form that will physically usurp motor control of your body, force you to do weird body twitching motions, which are explicitly sexual. And yeah, I, you know, I, I agree that music is really powerful, wonderful, beautiful stuff. But it's not sacred. Jerry, get off your fucking soapbox and play some music. <laughs> well said. Damn, you really nailed that. That was awesome. What were they like to tour with? Oh, great. They're a great hang. Uh, they, you know, we all enjoyed it because we were all on the up and up. We were all rising. We were all optimistic. We were all enjoying the rocket ship. And um, I got Super 8 footage of all of them, by the way, since I had full access on and off stage. Uh, so I've got the licensing nightmare from hell <laughs> <laughs> with all those bands and including bands of the previous area too. I, I call it uh, bands of the cusp, you know, mm -hmm. the cusp between long hair and short hair, punk and hippies and yada, yada, yada. But I'll, you know, it's sitting in my vault for my private entertainment, but getting it released. Oh my God. Yeah. 
licensing nightmare. So during this time period, um, you released a Zenyatta Mandata. That's your third record. The police's two most overt ska songs, Man in a Suitcase and Canary in a Coal Mine, are on this record. Yeah. Okay, now you've dated it. Yes, we were quite, we were pretty successful then. We were headlining festivals at that point in Europe. I've always wondered if the emergence of two-tone had any influence on you guys doing those two songs. No. Um, no, they didn't. It was Don Letts who caused all that to happen. Uh, you know that name? I do know Don Letts. Yeah, he was, a, amongst other things, he was a DJ at the Roxy. Yeah. So he, the thing was that even glue-sniffing punks got to chill sometimes. Yeah. And there's no such thing as chill punk music. So Don Letts would play hostile dub reggae, which was really dark, suitably angry, uh, suitably hostile, but chill. And um, that's where all the skinny white musicians discovered the upside down reggae groove. And that's, uh, I think, I give credit to Clash for being the first band to attempt to play it. But all of us we're listening to the drums and going Topper Heaton, me, Rat Scabies, and the rest of us were listening to what the hell is he doing? What the what? What? No backbeat, the, the snare and the bass drum landing together <laughs> uh, instead of in opposition. Um, I have had actually already figured this out because I discovered reggae in college in Berkeley, California. Um, so I had already done that calculation and I also had my secret sauce which was my Arabic upbringing. Yeah. And the fact that Arabic music shares some fundamental building blocks with reggae. That emphasis on the third beat of the bar, hide the one, there is no one, one shall not be expressed. <gasps> two, three, four, <gasps> two, three, four, <laughs> two, three, four. Uh, and so it came a lot easier to me. And while the others had to kind of study it and execute it, what they studied, it was already in my DNA. Yeah, so we're talking about uh, Baladi music. Baladi. Baladi music. And you, you grew up in, uh, a chunk of your childhood was in Beirut. Yeah. Well, I'm, I left America when I was two months old mm -hmm. um, and didn't get back till I was 18. A lot of people who are not Jamaican that uh, come to play reggae and, and ska, there is, there's a little, it's a little stilted. Because, like you said, it's not the music that they grew up with. They're trying to train their brains to play it backwards. Well, Charlie Brown, uh, was what was he? He was Madness, or was he UB40? He, they, yeah, some of the drummers really had it. I mean, they really nailed it. I wasn't stiff at all. Um, mm -hmm. Because those kids grew up in a multiracial society. And strangely, there was racial tension in England, but not between the Jamaicans and the working-class white kids. Mm -hmm. It was between the Jamaicans, the working class white kids against the Indian and Pakistani. Yeah. Somehow by some miracle, because it was actually, let's be honest, it was kind of the skinheads were racist. There was sure. a lot, a, yeah. a, a strong racist element within skinhead and skinheads were very adjacent to ska. And, um, a lot of the ska energy came from skinheads and, the miracle is that they didn't have a problem with their Jamaican brothers and sisters, I guess, because I like the music and weren't <laughs> threatened by them. Whereas the immigrants from India and Pakistan were highly educated and were taking better jobs and somehow regarded as more of a threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those those two tone groups, um, literally black and white, all happy playing together as a rare thing. For sure. When you went to college in Berkeley, uh, what kind of. How did you get hip to reggae, and what, what was the stuff that you ca caught your attention first? Well, I was the boss jock at the boss radio station playing the boss hits that my boss told me to play <laughs> uh, at WKLX, uh, Berkeley, California. And uh, I was the guy handling imports. Uh, since I was the guy who had been outside of America, I got imports. And amongst the imports, which was mostly prog rock out of England in those days, um, suddenly there's... Bob Marley, Catch a Fire. And uh, as soon as I heard that, whoa, uh, this is a whole new world. And so that's where I discovered reggae. Interesting, yeah. And you also in the book talk about seeing Bob Marley and the Whalers in Leeds in like um, 
76, I believe. Oh, yeah. On our way back down from Newcastle. That's written in a way where it suggests that that's a turning point for you, getting to watch Carlton Barrett, the drummer, and really kind of studying what he's doing. Well, I may have overemphasized the turning point, but it certainly was a big step in that direction to see him do it. Um, and basically a drum solo all the way through. Drum fills every other bar. Uh, really busy, and yet somehow not intruding. Uh, on Because I guess Marley had such charisma at the front of the stage that the rest of the band could do what could go ape crazy wild and not take any of the light off of off of marley that's definitely something about your drumming that you brought to the police mm-hmm. banging banging a lot of shit but yes. doing fills in places <laughs> where <laughs> maybe uh maybe a standard rock drummer wouldn't do a fill there but it, it works really well well i don't do them there anymore either no by the way doing my uh, deranged for orchestra police songs deranged for orchestra that last um you know that vocal pickup into the chorus you know, every breath you, mm-hmm. now that I'm the arranger and I put those vocals there, uh, I don't want a drum fill right on top of that. I want space. I want that vocal to be all alone and the drums come in on the downbeat, you know, le- you know, so I actually have a different philosophy about all that now. But when I was young, I just used to like to bang my drums. Oh yeah. Young, young drummers way different than a, than a drummer with some, some years. Yep. You were also you were you got really interested in splash symbols. Uh, so splash symbols weren't really popular at the time when you started getting into splash symbols. Well, I had to get them from a toy store. Yeah, because they were like novelty, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd seen them play. You know, Louis Belson and you know that era of drummers. They use splash symbols. So wait, you're telling us that your initial your initial splash symbols were just like straight up from like toy toys kits? No. Yeah, way. <laughs> and and I talked because when I got a. Uh, a sponsorship deal with tasty i said hey you should be making these and they said well no because they only you know in a rock environment they're only gonna last three gigs we can't sell a product that's gonna last three gigs um so, but they put their metallurgists to work and they figured out how to make a symbol a splash symbol that's very very light that will survive more than three gigs Tight, very tight uh high pitch snare that's another thing i i don't feel like other bands were doing that at the time am i is that correct? Well, that was my rebellion against Old Wave, where when I was with Curve Dare, some producers came in. Uh, we recorded our first album. It was fantastic. What an experience. Boy, that was some of the most fun I've ever had. And the record company rejected it. Um, and they said, no, we got to do it again. Uh, we'll get some real producers in and do it again. And the producers came in and killed the band. Um, they just, what the, you know, it was a prog rock band. They tried to turn this into Bonnie Wright or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they, for the drums, they said, "Okay, go take a walk. Uh, come back. Uh, we'll, 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 you know, uh, come back in a couple hours when we've got your drums sounding great." And so I go and take a walk, and I come back in a couple hours, and the drums sound fucking. Are you kidding? Dead. <laughs> Flap, flop, boom. And the fat back. They kept talking about a nice fat back. And I said, "Well, what's a fat back?" Well, here, check check out your snare. <clears throat> You know, mm-hmm. that's it's fat. Oh yes, it's fat. <laughs> it's back, but I ain't playing that. Um, and so it was a struggle right there. And the record was a dead album uh, by a killed group. Uh, and the drums, you know, it was a struggle. But you know, I guess my rebellion was to tune them way back up so high you could bring a bird down out of the sky, uh, and it would <laughs> cut through too. Yeah, you know that, that was something I learned very early on is that when you get a drum sound in sound check, and you, uh, you go around the top, and boom, 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 fantastic. Okay, kick in the band, and that bump you can't hear it disappears. Yeah. Uh, but Bing, bang, bong, that cuts through, and so that's yeah. why my drums were so high to cut through. Yeah, and they bounce better too. Yeah, so that that is something that. I feel like carried on into the eighties and nineties with bands like the high, the high snare was something more and more and more bands adopted. Well, another thing I would have to give uh, credit to Clive Stubblefield, mm-hmm. um, who also had a very high pitched snare drum sound. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It was, it was just lively spark, more sparkly, had more energy, had more, by the way, that snare drum, 
that we're talking about. I'm looking at it right now. It's right over here. The snare. Oh, I played all the hits on it. I played all the tours on it. Um, here it is. And so you you have a pearl snare, but a Tama drums or back then. Yeah, uh, the hoops. The hoops are mismatched. Um, I could never find another drum that had that sound. So I wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night thinking it had been stolen, lost, or something. <laughs> but finally, uh, Tama made a signature snare drum. They say, well, what do you want? You know, triple action snare release, mother of pearl, something, you know, no, 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 no. Just replicate this drum. Mm -hmm. um, and it took many prototypes back and forth from, to Japan. Uh, their metallurgists analyzed the rim, analyzed the, the radius of the hoop, and the you know all this stuff um and eventually they got it right and i now have any number of them i can go to i can you know i'm going to denver tomorrow there'll be a tama drum set there i've never seen it before but it'll have that snare drum it'll sound perfect by the way uh forgive the pun pun intended it's a hit drum oh yes <laughs> you know you'll find it in recording studios uh they'll have a ludwig black beauty and they'll have a, a sc snare Nice. Nice. You know, for, for two completely different contrasts. You know, we need a little more high end of that. Like, pull out the steward. Uh, we need some depth. Steward. We need some yeah. we need some fat back. Pull out the Ludwig. <laughs> yeah. Where do you land now on on snare tone? You still you still feel the same or yeah, yeah. Well, because it's so much more responsive, it has a wider vocabulary. There's more stuff you mm -hmm. can do on it. Yeah. Uh, of course I don't need to worry about cutting through. I need to worry about not killing the orchestra. Yeah. So I've yeah. had to develop a entirely different technique for playing these drums and the cymbals as well. I have a whole completely different concept of both what cymbals to use and how to hit them. Mm. Because, you know, I hit a big rude crash and I lose the next four bars of orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. What about what about the China? Do you Nah. No, don't mess with the China? Uh, I I just it's a lot. I haven't gotten around to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an ugly thing that sits there at a wrong angle, and you know, it's a sort of, it's sort of dated. It's sure. Sort of. Uh, I don't use the octaban. I I go through fans. My current fad is this little tiny Latin snare. Okay. Tiny little thing, but it actually is exactly the same sound as my old uh, rim shots, my old uh, rim clicks. Hmm. But much easier to get to i don't have to turn the stick around and so on just that drum sitting right there for just just for rim clicks yeah that's great i like that i go through fat. i'll get bored of this and you know tom will come out with some new shape of drum and i'll i'll be all over that i do have the octobands here at the studio which i use for overdubs all the time so back to your book there's a there's a few things i was unaware of with your book uh in terms of your story i think the biggest one that surprised me was was hearing the story of clark kent and how, uh, I mean, I'm already familiar with Clark Kent. I know all the songs. I had no idea that Clark Kent charted before the police. Oh, yes. That is the part that really, really shocked me. <laughs> My favorite brag. Please, let's go. Well, I mean, the first time the other blonde heads, you know, the first time the three blonde heads were on national television was as Clark Kent's backing band. And there's <laughs> old Stingo in a gorilla's mask, miming. <laughs> Miming my baseline. <laughs> I never miss an opportunity to remind him of that indignity. But, you know, he did kind of have his revenge mm -hmm. by writing all the big hits and he got me all over, you know, world TV. Uh, but I have that tiny little straw to, to clutch onto that I got your first television appearance. You owe it all to me. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. So the police. So had you already you released Roxanne? It didn't. It didn't. It was a flop, and then you released Don't Care. Is that the order things went in? Yes, I released it myself back to my own record label, the Cryptone label, mm -hmm. uh, which was just me with a Letra set and some art and creating a label uh, and on the phone selling boxes. But then a miracle happened. Radio One, national pop radio station, uh, BBC, put it on the playlist. <laughs> You know, they have a weekly meeting where they listen to all the records and some make it on the list, some don't. I got on the list uh, by some quirk. Then suddenly, I, you know, I, I can, you know, I can't have a hit or even sustain my radio play if I can't get records into stores. So I had to go to A&M 
And Miles, by the way, was in America at that time, I think, with Squeeze. Um, and I had to go to A&M and say, look, I got this record. I got airplay. And they heard it and said, yeah, let's run. And they got that thing turned around in the deal. And by the way, let's close the deal with the band, too, because uh, they only did a singles deal for the first couple singles. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they, they tied it all up. And sure enough, with A&M, able to get print the records get them into the stores and expand on the radio play into all the other regional stations and i we had a little hit now okay so how serious were you when you talk about that you were you were keeping your identity as clark kent a secret well absolutely secret but it was a tough thing because i didn't want i didn't want it to be a secret i wanted to brag to everybody um uh i'm only human for god's sake (laughs) and i was even more human then than i am now yeah and so, but it was a very effective ploy. I would do my interviews for Sounds Magazine, for Melody Make, for NME, uh, and I would do it in a, in, a, in masks. And I, every every story I did, I would tell a completely different story. You know, I'm 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 an archaeologist, and I discovered these songs underneath the you know the tomb of you know Hatshepsut. You know, the next time I'm a you know, I'm a nuclear worker and there was an accident where I accidentally got too much radiation and my brain exploded and I now speak 47 languages and, you know, whatever. Just utter, utter, utter bullshit. Uh, and and in the mask. And also the question was, you know, the zeitgeist for about five minutes was asking, who is Clark Kent? And then they thought it might be Frank Zappa or, you know, or David Bowie, somebody suggested. Are you kidding? American and, you know. Anyway, there were all these different theories uh, about who it was until fucking NME, they busted me. And they said, oh, it's that, it's that drummer in the fake punk rock band. <laughs> and that was it. But luckily for me, that was it for Clark Kent. Because as you can see in the diaries, I was already thinking, I don't need these guys. Yeah, yeah. You thought you were going to have a solo career. Ah, oh, screw this. I can write my own. Ah, I get the, you know, ah, these, you know, moi, ha, ha, ha. Fortunately, uh, it sank without a trace, just in the nick of time for the police to achieve world domination. So th- when you when you went on Top of the Pops, you were already exposed, and they, the Top of the Pops producer... No, they didn't. I was not exposed at that time. They wanted to do the exposing. And th- what they said to Melvin Miltost, our manager, which was Miles, also in a mask, uh, <laughs> where's Miles Copeland? Who's you? Who are you? I mean, we're we, we not going to talk to Miles. No, Miles Copeland is unavailable in there. I mean, Milk Toast, what are you talking about? <laughs> Melvin Miltos, you know, <laughs> and uh, that was a, it was a scene and they wanted to expose Clark Kent. And so every version of a mask, I know that'll scare the children. You know, we're a family show, you know, whatever. So eventually I ended up with like an exotic um, makeup that kind of sort of obscured not um and soon thereafter nme busted me i see yeah, bastards yeah. you know with nme i always had a, a hate hate relationship with them um <laughs> uh, uh which is what i wanted to get onto their pages but they always they were the first to spot the police's carpet baggers and so they always took every opportunity to take swipes at us god yeah. damn it those fucking bastards <laughs> Anyhow, we made it. We made it out, and we we somehow we survived the NME. And then years later, decades go by, uh, accolades, awards, world domination, all of it, and we do the reunion tour. And I tell the publicist, huh, "I'd quite like to have a word with the NME now, after all that's been, <laughs> been done." And uh, and I was all planning about how I would joyfully, gleefully tear the guy to whatever journalist you know, to shreds just for the fun of it, because I could. And those fucking bastards declined. Oh, Sorry, not interested in the police. <laughs> there we are playing fucking stadiums around the world and the <laughs> fucking enemy. <laughs> Damn. Okay, they, okay, okay, I'll confess. There is a little love in my heart for them. Okay. <laughs> so there was one reunion I'm, I'm curious about, and then we'll let you go. Clark Kent did a little reunion in 2020 on uh the uh, on your youtube channel oh that's right yes yes clark kent reunion uh in fact he showed up right here and made this video i don't know if you've seen that video i've seen the video yeah but it was made with photo booth a laptop open on the counter here and uh since the camera doesn't move 
I discovered that you can overdub video. Mm -hmm. And, and if, the, if the camera hasn't moved, you run the track again and do it standing over there. And now, you, you know, with matting, you, there's two of you or three of you or four of you. Um, and so I was able to do a Clark Kent uh, movie or, or, or I, you know, what happens is I go to bed and I can hear strange sounds coming from the studio. And in the morning I come in and there's the smell of kind of burnt train set, you know, uh, and there's these amazing tracks just sitting there right on my desk. <laughs> it's hard to get that burnt wire smell out though. Really? I love the video effects of the, of the Clark Kent band. It's a, uh, it's very un unnerving. Let's just say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because of uh, the green, the green face paint, which means that you can, not, you know, see right through, you can, in between the, 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 the jack the coat and the collar and the hat is the the back wall uh mm -hmm. you know you, it's not there you see right through it and then it's a couple of places where they overlap and you can see the other clark kent mm -hmm. in the space between the hat and the collar yeah I i'm sure you know actually i was you know i'm sure it took probably about three weeks to make that thing i'm just gonna pretend that 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 sting and andy are in the backup band again <laughs> wait 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 <laughs> hang on a second <laughs> Andy's not tall enough and Sting's not skinny enough. I'm still going to believe it though. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, head over to our Patreon. Thank you for listening to In Defense of Scott. Please rate and review this podcast and tell a friend. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at In Defense of Ska. Pick up Aaron's book, In Defense of Ska, at your local bookstore or online. This podcast is edited by Chris Reeves of Ska Punk International. This is your co host, Adam Davis of Omnigon, leaving you by saying Ska now more than ever. You didn't get to ask Stuart Copeland what he calls the punk beat. Hmm. Something tells me it would have been a weird name. Yeah, I think so. He probably would have had a weird name for it. W or would he have said, that's my beat? W would he have taken ownership? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of the cool thing about, uh, you know, playing drums in the area that he played drums in. Is he can, he can take ownership of a lot of that stuff. Yeah. He was the originator. So we had a great conversation with Stuart. It wasn't as long as our typical episode, and we didn't get to talk to him behind the curtain, but... Follow us behind the curtain because we have a lot to talk about. I read his whole book. I have lots and lots of notes, stuff I didn't get to ask him. So we're going to go through lots of that information, which I, and there's stuff I learned about the band I wasn't aware of. And I'm excited to have you teach it to me. I'm going to teach Adam. $5, meet us back behind the curtain. Yeah. We're going to talk about how much Aaron Carnes has been influenced by Stuart Copeland. Yes. And join us next week. Who do we have next week? Very special episode with flying raccoon suit yes when you save on auto insurance for driving safe with usaa safe pilot you'll feel like a big deal even in a traffic jam save up to 30 percent with usaa safe pilot restrictions apply 